the world of artificial intelligence, the very last block of Singularity University Czech Summit 2018. And we will open this part of the program with a man who was on this stage, on this very stage just two hours ago. And he was talking about driverless cars. But I have mentioned that uh, he is also an expert in robotics and especially challenging the, let's say, ordinary ideas in the areas of self-aware robots and self-replicating robots. And right now, he's coming with a topic called, I quote, the last frontiers of AI, robots that create art and fall in love. Ladies and gentlemen, Hot Lipson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us once again on the stage. How close or how far is the future when robots will fall in love? With people or with, in, with each other? Oh, two categories. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, sooner than we think. But, you know, who knows what love is, right? I mean, we haven't figured this out ourselves. Do you think we have already reached the level when people fall in love with robots? That, uh, you know, we're close to that. People uh, have feeling towards inanimate objects, towards teddy bears. It's enough to stick googly eyes onto a robot and people have emotions about it. Yeah, so, but love, almost. Oh, to please take us to the last frontiers of AI. Okay, thank you. So, uh, you know, I, it, we, we hear about AI all the time. We, we, we hear about all these different things that are happening. What I want to talk a little bit about where AI is going into the future. Almost all the, the stuff that you're hearing about artificial intelligence is happening right now. But what's going to happen in the future? Where is all this technology going? So to understand that, we first have to look a little bit at what is driving AI to try to understand where it's going. And of course, at the bottom of AI and, and how fast it's accelerating is Moore's Law, this idea that computers are getting faster, cheaper, and better at an exponential rate. And when I say exponential rate, I don't mean that figuratively, as in accelerating. I mean that quite literally, mathematically, doubling every so many months. Uh, here you can see a chart for about 120 years of computing power. And you can see how it accelerates exponentially. Every tick here is a hundredfold computing power. I recently gave a talk at uh, one of our uh, classes at Columbia University, Ethics of AI, and I asked the students to look at this chart and calculate how fast computers are going to be 20, 25 years from now, in the middle of their career. These are all students that are beginning their career. So they pulled out their phones and they started calculating, and one student raised her hand and said, one million times faster. This is how fast computers are going to be 20 or 25 years from now, one million times faster than they are today. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. But while you think about that and how fast AI is moving because it's riding this curve, one thing I want to tell you is that AI, this is not the entire story. In fact, there are other factors that are driving how fast AI is moving forward. And we know that new algorithms have been invented in the past couple of years that are making AI do things it couldn't do before, even if Moore's Law kept on going for another 100 years. We also know there's an exponential growth in data that is fueling this new kind of AI, this new kind of AI called machine learning that learns the more it sees, the more it experiences, and those experiences are growing exponentially as well. So AI is riding this curve as well. And finally, there is the cloud that allows these AI systems to teach other AI systems, and that is creating an even faster growing AI. So again, cars can teach other cars. If there's a software that learns to play chess, it learns that by playing against another software that plays chess, and together they learn even faster. So AI systems teaching other AI systems through the cloud is another one of these exponential drivers that is making it move forward. So these, I think, are the four exponentials driving artificial intelligence. But that doesn't help you understand where AI is going to go next. So I've been thinking a lot about the kind of uh, AI and its progress over the years. And I've realized that one of the reasons that artificial intelligence has been hard to predict is because it doesn't move forward smoothly. Unlike computing power, let's say, that 
that improves every two, uh, doubles its performance every so many months, AI doesn't just move forward in a smooth curve. AI moves forward in waves, and every wave brings a new capability that the previous AI could not do. Every generation of AI brings new capabilities that were sort of only a dream in the previous generation. So let's try to look at some of these waves and try to predict what's going to happen next. I'll start by talking about two waves that have already happened, and you might be familiar with them. So the first 50 years of artificial intelligence, starting from the 50s all the way to the 90s, was the world of symbolic AI, the idea that AI is based on logic, that you have clever people writing rules if then else, and those rules get executed, and with these rules, a computer can look into the future and play chess and make decisions, and calculate taxes, and do whatever a computer needs to do, make medical decisions based on expert system. So that was the first 50 years of AI. It's the world of logic and, and, uh, and uh, rule-based uh, AI. Second wave of AI is the wave of predictive analytics. That's the wave that started in the 90s when the first machine learning algorithms began to become became popular, and people started looking at developing AI systems that can look at numbers and make predictions about the future. So these systems are everywhere today. They're predicting the stock market. They're predicting how many cucumbers you're going to sell next month. Everything in industry is using already this predictive AI that is looking at data and making prediction. But this predictive analytics is only good for tabulated data, data that you can store in a database or perhaps in a uh, in a spreadsheet. The third revolution, the third wave of AI that started sort of about five years ago and we're in the middle of, is the wave of cognitive AI. And that's the ability of AI systems to understand information that is not easily tabulated and quantified in numbers. Information like images and video, natural languages and audio, information that just a few years ago we thought would be impossible for machines to understand. But now machines can understand that, and that is, that's kind of information. And that's unleashing a whole new world of all kinds of opportunities. For example, a machine can understand and read emotions from a human face better than the average human can. All these things that we thought would be impossible for machines to do are now possible. Things like Amazon Go, a new kind of supermarket that you walk into and grab anything you want off the shelf and walk out with no cashiers, and you still pay but it's all driven by a camera that can understand what you're doing in the store, what you're buying, what you're putting in your bag, what you almost buy and put back on the shelf. All these are new possibilities enabled by AI. Now, by this sort of cognitive wave. So this cognitive wave of AI that we are in the middle of now is, is a double-edged sword. It's something that has positive and negative effects in all kinds of areas. So, for example, lots of people are going to lose jobs because of driverless cars, as we talked about. For example, I uh, recently gave a talk at a, uh, a large uh, conference on, on uh, automotive collision repair. And the uh, first time I heard that people were sad that there's going to be fewer accidents and fewer jobs around fixing cars. But at the same time, lots of lives are going to be saved. Some people are worried that drones are going to fly around and target people and assassinate people. Uh, but at the same time, we have drones, the same kind of drones, the same kind of technology that can fly around agricultural fields and, and, uh, and spray only the plants that need to be sprayed and create much healthier food and uh, much better yield. So every technology has a double-edged sword. And every, every time you think of a bad application of AI, I can probably think of a hundred positive ones at the same time. If you're worried about mass surveillance, for example, that's being enabled by AI, the very same technology is now beginning to and allow us to find missing children. And I think, uh, you know, human trafficking will all but disappear because of this ability to track and recognize people across uh, different ages. So everything is a double-edged sword. All right, so these are all technologies that are available now, and it's the third wave. So what are the next waves going to look like? So I can already see some of these waves bubbling in academia, and I want to share two of these uh, with you today. The next wave that I see coming is a wave of creativity, of creative machines. 
So you see, we hold creativity as sort of something that is uniquely human, uniquely this, this mysterious, powerful force that's within each one of us to create new things out of thin air. And for the large part, we humans were the only creatures on this planet able to be creative. But that might not last for long. So the interesting thing about intelligence uh, is that sort of there are two kinds of intelligence. One of them, the first three waves of AI that I talked about, are all analytical. In other words, they consume a lot of data and they make a decision. They consume data from the, from the stock market and they decide whether to buy or to sell, or they consume data from cameras of a vehicle and decide whether to turn left or to turn right. So it's all analytical, consuming a lot of data and reducing it to a decision. But there's another kind of intelligence, and that is the intelligence associated with creativity. The ability to create something from thin air. Not to consume data and make a decision, but actually to start from a need, from an idea, from a principle, and create lots of new things out of it. It's almost the opposite of the first three waves. So the way to think about this is analysis versus synthesis. AI in the first three waves was very good at analysis, but synthesis, creating new things, is still the domain of humans. And frankly, we don't really understand what is human creativity. We use the word creativity, but to cloak something we don't really understand. Psychologists have been thinking about this, philosophers have been debating, but we don't really know what creativity is and how it works. But we have seen creativity other than humans, for example, evolution. One could argue that evolution is able to, natural evolution, to create lots of new things, and we can harness that kind of creativity inside a computer to create lots of different things. For example, here's a robot that was designed by an evolutionary process. It was designed by having lots of robots compete with each other in a virtual world and undergo mutation and selection for thousands of generations, and the best one gets to crawl out into the physical world through a 3D printer. And here it is sort of designed by a machine. Here's another, another example of electronic circuits. And I know most people don't think of electronic circuits as being an uh, act of uh, creativity, but really, for electronic engineers, designing analog circuits is a very challenging synthesis challenge. And uh, now computers can design analog circuits better than many experts. For example, here is an antenna designed by an AI system that outperforms any antenna designed by a human expert. It's synthesized it from scratch. This antenna is actually now on a satellite in a space mission because it performs so well. So machines can design everything from antennas to robots to, to products and so forth. But there's another interesting kind of creativity that is now emerging. We've heard a lot about these deep networks that can take, for example, an image and decide if it's a human or not. Well, in a strange way, you can sort of run this backwards. It's uh, in a kind of, uh, and start to say, hey, I have a human, now generate the image for me. Instead of starting with the image and reaching a decision that it's a human, you can start with a human and go backwards. And it's fascinating to watch what happens when you do that. When you look at these images, for example, it's interesting to note that these are images of people that do not exist. They were just generated by an AI system that looks, that has seen enough people and has learned enough about the world that it can generate images of people that do not exist. And I look at these images and I think to myself, I've seen this person before, for sure. I mean, this, this, these look so, they, they look so real, but they're all fake. They're all generated by an AI system that can generate more and more, as many people as you want, synthesizing them from scratch. So these are people, but AI can do this not just with people, with almost anything. These are bedrooms that do not exist. They were just generated, imagined by an AI system. These are plants that do not exist, horses that do not exist, couches, buses. These are architectural buildings that do not exist. What does it mean for architectural creativity when machine can generate blueprints of buildings 
that do not exist, can imagine products and bicycles that do not exist and can do that as many times as it wants. But machine creativity isn't just limited to creating uh, sort of electronic circuits and, and, and products. It can also be used to make art. I want to show you one example. This is a, a robot that paints that I have uh, at home. And uh, a few years ago, my wife and I took uh, this kind of oil painting class in the weekends. And after about two months of painting, the instructor comes to me, and I thought he was going to compliment me for my painting, but he said, maybe you should be doing something else. Maybe, uh, maybe this is not for you. So when a roboticist gets mad, they build a robot. And that's what I did. I built a robot that, uh, that uh, learns to paint. And in the beginning, it painted a little bit like me. Uh, you know, really didn't paint very well. But now it paints pretty well. It paints large oil on canvas paintings. Um, uh, this is my cat, for example. Lots of different paintings, different uh, shapes and sizes, and it's getting better over time. And I know this is not Picasso, but it's better than most, what most people uh, can paint. In fact, this painting here just won an international art competition. It's a painting of a flower that does not exist. It was painted entirely from the imagination of the machine that wanted to paint a flower, and it painted it out of nothing. And I wanted to send this uh, painting to my instructor. So that's, uh, that's one example of creativity, and we'll see how far this goes. I mean, how, but it's interesting to see how this is moving forward. And one of the things that's really interesting about creativity, if you think about it, what is the ultimate thing that an AI can create? Is it art? Is it robots? So there is now a new program, a research program, developed, focused on creating AI that can create not art, not robots, but the next better AI. So we'll see where that goes. But again, you can see this sort of self-amplifying element that underlies all these accelerating technologies. All right, so people look at this and say, OK, you have a machine that can create art, that can write music, that can design things, can recognize emotions in people. But can it have emotions itself? Will an AI ever be able to feel emotion, not to fake emotions, but not to recognize emotions, but to actually have emotions. And that brings me to one of the biggest challenges and maybe the holy grails of robotics AI and AI, and that is sentience, the idea of making machines that feel. And we're sort of, sort of the old alchemists. We're trying to breathe life into a machine. So the nature of sentience is another one of these things that people debate and philosophers and psychologists and nobody really knows. But I think that, that sentience is really happens. That all that happens is when the AI, instead of you take all this amazing AI and creativity and instead of modeling the world around it, the AI turns on itself and begins to model itself. Instead of modeling the world, it models its own body, its own thinking process, and then you begin to get self-awareness. So to test this, we created a, a simple robot in the lab. It's a very interesting robot. It has lots of sensors, lots of uh, measurements that it can take, but it is blind. It cannot see anything about the world. It can only sense itself. And this robot needs to learn how to walk, but it can't sense anything except itself. And over a period of four days, it begins, the AI in the robot begins to, to, to begin, begins to create a model of itself. And you can see in the beginning, it has no clue if it's a snake or a spider or a tree. It has no, no idea of how the motors are connected and where the sensors are placed. But over time, over about a period of four days, it begins to learn. Halfway through the process, it begins to figure out it has four legs but doesn't quite know where they're connected. And four days into the process, it pretty much figured how, what it looks like. It then uses that self-image that is created of itself to figure out how to move. And uh, again, it's not that there's some clever programmer wrote down rules to program this thing. It didn't learn how to walk in reality. It just learned in its imagination. And here it is walking for the first time in its life after babbling and experiencing the world a little bit. So it's a very crude, model of self. This is nowhere as sophisticated 
uh, self-awareness as we humans have or even a dog has, but I think it's on the path of getting there. To test it, we did something very cruel. We chopped off a leg and we watched what happened. And uh, within about a day, the robot's self-image also loses a leg. Again, not because a sensor came off and, and, and it's, uh, there's some rule that said switch to plan B or something like that. No, it's all internal. The leg came off, the dynamics changed, the robot's self-image began to adapt. And here it is, learning how to move forward without a leg. And I know it's very sad, but we did put the leg back on and the robot is now happily retired. But here you can see the robot moving forward without a leg. Uh, and sort of, again, not being programmed to do that, but sort of because it's self-model uh, self adapted. So that's sort of the, the story of, uh, of self-awareness. We don't know where it's going to go. Uh, we don't know what's, uh, where this uh, will end, but I think we have this powerful AI. When it turns on itself, it begins uh, to create these amazing things. So you might, you might wonder, is all this AI good? Is it a good thing? Should, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Maybe this is uh, something we should, be, should avoid. The truth is that AI is really a mirror of its user. Good people will use it to do good things. Bad people will use it to do bad things. Some people will use it to create wealth. Some people will use it to create abundance. It's a very powerful tool, but really it's a reflection of ourselves. Thank you. How did you find out? How did the robot imagine itself? How can you see what he imagines okay. or it, it. imagines? Right. So, I'm not so, very sure. Right, so that's a great question. We, we built in into this robot a way for us to peek inside and understand what it is doing. But we could only do that because it is a very, very simple robot. Okay. Uh, newer robots are more sophisticated. We can't tell what they're thinking. It's more like, uh, it's like a mouse. You, you can, you can put, uh, you can put uh, probes into it and you can guess, but you can't really know what it's thinking and sometimes it's thinking different things. Do you think about this robot as it is it or he? Her. Or her. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> this is, actually we have a couple of generations. Uh, this is the grandmother, there's a couple of younger ones. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a whole new set of generations. Each one of them gets more complex, but this is where it started. Is she conscious? I think, you know, one of, these, one of the challenges with consciousness is that we tend to think about it as a black and white. You know, is it conscious? Is it not conscious? The truth is that there are lots of gray gradations of consciousness. Is a dog conscious? A little bit, not as much as a human. Is a, a monkey is a little bit more conscious? So I think this robot is self-aware at a micro level, as micro self-awareness, like tiny, tiny amount. So it's by no means something, it's not gonna wake up tomorrow and, uh, and be your friend, all right? But it's, uh, but it's going to, but it's, I think it's on the path. And as all of AI moves forward for other reasons, moves forward and gets more and more sophisticated, the same AI when it's turned inside will create all these uh, a better and better self-awareness. Well, that's the so-called zombie argument, asking if zombie has conscious or is conscious, if she feels that she is conscious or not. Do you think it's enough to say, this robot thinks she is conscious, to say, okay, she has consciousness? You know, I try to avoid these questions. You know why? Because oh yeah, yeah. Because people. I like the questions. Yeah, some people yeah, try yeah, to avoid. Yeah, I like to avoid it because I think. We've been asking these questions for thousands of years. And we have no answers yet. We have yet. no answers. So I'm not going to answer this. I'm just going to build one. <laughs> and I think, uh, I think that's, the, that's the ultimate test. And then other people can argue about it. What will be your message to your painting teacher when you send the picture or uh, actually the final, for example, portrait of your cat, which I have to say I very, very much like because, you know, you can see what's on yeah, live. That's right. So we can, I can paint. Yeah, we are you. cat people. Yeah, yeah. What's going to be the message for uh, your painting teacher? Will you admit 
that you didn't pay it? Well, I would say, first of all, never piss off a roboticist. That's the, that's the, it comes back. Well, we are talking about artificial <laughs> intelligence, I would. <laughs> But uh, no, I think, I think uh, you know, that, you know, my, my uh, instructor was, was, was correct. I, I, I did, did not paint well, and uh, I, I admit that. But, uh, and you when know, you say this painting, will you admit that you didn't paint it? Yes, of course, I'm proud of it. I think, I think that, uh, You know, I talk a lot about painting and, and art uh, and machines, and, and frequently I get a lot of pushback. You have artists that uh, will believe that uh, it's okay for computers to replace factory workers. It's even okay for computers to, to replace drivers, but for a computer to replace an artist, impossible. And so you suddenly, it, it really pulls out a lot of biases out of people when you start talking about creativity. Even, uh, you know, uh, engineers, uh, faculty in, in, in engineering, when you start talking about machines that can be creative, it's a very, very challenging topic. And people are ready to admit that a robot can make art, but they are not ready to, to concede that the robot is an artist. And that's, I think, a very, very delicate point. It's a, it comes out in this, what, it, what is art? Does it, do you have to feel in order to create art, or can you just create art without feeling? This is in a very deep, uh, deep uh, challenges around art that uh, are, again, for people have been debating for millennia. I would love to hear his answer, the answer of your instructor, if you send this painting. Maybe he would say, oh, hot. He was so bad when he was in here, but I saw something in him, and he is so great today. Yeah, he'd probably say, it's, this robot is a grand, granddaughter for my class. That's right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Hot Lipson. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.